like I said yesterday, my talks, uh, my Bible reflections, they're interrelated. And I want to build further. So yesterday I talked a lot about we live in a secular world and being a follower of Christ in this secular world has its challenges. And we have to find this balance of being in the world but not of the world. We can't just run and hide away from the world as it is. But at the same time, we don't want to be absorbed into the world so that no one can see the difference between us as Christians and the rest of the world. Today, I want to talk about the fact that one thing that will help us to navigate this secular world, this, this society that we live in, will, of course, be wisdom and understanding uh, that comes from God. But we need to have our eyes open to see this world around us so that we can navigate this world. And that's where I want to take inspiration from, from this very short verse. I'm being a bit naughty and taking one Bible verse and, 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 and building so much on it. Uh, some of the theologians here will say, oh, Lou, that's not very good exegesis and uh, approach. But I will give it a little bit of context uh, so you understand why I, I've, I've chosen this verse. Because, again, I, I like to use images and, and metaphors. And to cope, to be a follower of Christ in this secular world, to cope in this world that we live in right now, it, it requires some wisdom and discernment so that we can navigate navigate there we are always going into uncharted territory you know every generation says this we're finding ourselves in uncharted territory that we've never been before we've never tried this is how every generation feels so of course we feel this way too we are we we're seeing advancement in technology that we we cannot even imagine we're seeing political unrest we're seeing wars we're seeing medical development there's so much out there. We're being faced with questions that no generation has faced before because our society is growing, our society is changing. On, uh, on, on principles of morals and ethics, we're being challenged as well. What's right, what's wrong? And it's, it's hard to navigate some of these things because there's nothing in the Bible that directly relates to these things. So, for example, people are asking difficult questions about artificial intelligence. What does that mean for us and for our society? Robots, what does that mean for us and our society? Yeah, there's some ethics around it. Uh, so, I wanted to go back and, and just look very briefly at this, um, at this passage, give it a little bit of context, and then we'll take it from there, yeah? Find the Bible verse. So I'm, I'm in Chronicles 1, 1 Chronicles 12. Just a quick reading. Where in verse 32, it says, well, I, you see, again, I have to put in a little bit in context. You know, again, depending on what Bible you're reading, it says, others joined David at Hebron. And it numbers these people who came to join David and what's interesting about this passage, you know, David, he's in a chaotic period because there's transition. He finally has to take over from Saul as king. So the battles have been fought, there have been the strife, and now he's gathering men to himself to establish his kingship. And of course, we know David was a warrior. He was also a worshiper, but he was very much a warrior, you know, and it tells us here that there were men from Judah, for example, in verse 24, there were men from Judah carrying shield and spear. So some fighters with him, you know. From Simeon, there were warriors. From Levi, you know, brave young warriors and all that. But interesting enough, it then in verse 32 mentions something that might be easy to miss. Because we're thinking, war, battle, let's establish this kingdom that God has given David. Let's fight. Let's get some warriors here. But he said, from Issachar. Men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. That's my prayer for all of us here. That we become men and women who really understand the times so that we know what to do 
in many of the different situations that we will face. We need to understand the spiritual climate we're living in. We need to understand the economic climate we're living in. We need to understand the scientific climate and the political climate, etc., etc. We need to understand the times. I did, when I did a bit of background reading here on, on this, it, it basically says, yeah, these men of Issachar were wise people who could help David make difficult decisions, who could understand what was going on and know how to lead and how to direct. See, they understood the times. And because they understood the times, therefore, they knew what to do. And I want to relate it a little bit to what I shared about yesterday. It's if we shrink back from understanding of our, of our world, from being in this world, if we shrink back, if we just hide in a corner, if we just block it all out and live in our own little Christian bubble, our little Christian ghetto, we won't understand the times and we won't know what to do in many of the different situations that we face. There's a couple of biblical examples that have inspired me for a long time that I want to share with you. For the sake of time, I won't read all of it. They're long chapters. But they are uh, two very concrete biblical examples where I think this whole principle of understanding the times and knowing what to do are Joseph and, uh, and Nehemiah. So if, just start, if I start with Joseph, every now and then I accidentally speak Danish. <laughs> this just start of it. If I start with Joseph, yeah, I love the story. Since I was a child, I love reading about Joseph. Fascinating character, you know. Everything from uh, how his brothers rejected him uh, and sold him into slavery, cast him in a pit, you know. But from, from, a, from, from an early time, Joseph had this sense of a call to leadership. And God was speaking to, to Joseph through dreams. And one of the things I think is very important about understanding the times is actually being able to interpret what's going on around us. The information is there. You know, I learned a principle that, that many times when God speaks to us or, or, or shows us things, there, there's revelation, interpretation, and then application. And sometimes it goes well, sometimes it goes completely wrong. If we take Joseph... God gives him a revelation through a dream, you know, that your brothers would bow down before you. And his interpretation about having a leadership position in, amongst his brethren and that he was favored by God, that was a correct interpretation. But I think his application was a bit problematic <laughs> because he basically just says, look at me, one day you guys are all going to bow down to me. And then it went very wrong for him. But we see later in his life, he learned some wisdom because we see this wonderful, very uh, inspiring life where he ends up in Egypt. He's in prison, again, through this gift God had given him for interpreting dreams and understanding these dreams. He was able to come out of prison because he, he, he was able to help Pharaoh in, in interpreting uh, Pharaoh's servants, you know, the baker and the, uh, the other guy. Uh, but anyway, he ended up out, but he got, again, when he was tested, when he got into trouble with Potiphar's wife, he knew what was right and wrong, and he kept his integrity. So because of this, he rose to a very prominent position. And one of the stories that, I, uh, that always inspires me is this whole idea where this dream came about seven years of famine, seven lean years, but seven plentiful years, and what he could do he could balance the, the short-term and the long-term needs. He could be very strategic. Now, I've heard one preacher criticize him, actually, because basically what he did, he did what a very good businessman would do. Now, I'm going to make a very random reference. Do you remember how everybody went crazy about toilet paper during corona? <laughs> basically, we know the law of supply and demand, yeah? So suddenly, there's a lack of toilet paper. Therefore, if you had toilet paper, you could sell it for some crazy prices. And you might question the, uh, Joseph's uh, ethics, but basically, he, they got this revelation that there was coming a time of famine after a time of plenty. 
And he was wise enough and strategic enough to make a plan, build storehouses, store as much of this uh, of the grain as possible, so that when the lean years came, the years of famine, they had this huge storehouse of food that they could now sell for profit. So if I would make my crazy little parallel, imagine you knew Corona is on its way back and you bought all the toilet paper in Denmark. <laughs> you become a millionaire. That's if people go crazy about toilet paper again. But basically, he was strategic enough. He was wise enough to say, we have this revelation that's coming. He didn't think, oh, well, let's just party and enjoy the good times. And when the bad times come, we'll just hunker down and pray and hope for the best. He was strategic in his thinking. He balanced the short-term needs with the long-term needs. He had understanding. He understood the times. He could see what was going on. God had given him insight, but his eyes were open too. He could see what was going on and therefore could make long-term plans, could make strategic decisions. And yes, he might have made some good money out of this thing and increased Pharaoh's wealth, but he, did, he didn't just hoard it for himself. He did, he did share. So that's why I don't think he's all bad. I think he did walk with integrity and he did do something that was very right. So he understood the times. He had wisdom from God. And his application of the, of, of, the, of, of the dream was just right. And he actually probably saved a nation from famine and, uh, and, uh, and destruction through starvation. Another example that has inspired me, especially when I was very much involved in uh, church planting, is Nehemiah, who... He was in a situation where he was working as the cupbearer for the king, but he discovered, he found out that we have a situation here where Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, they lie in ruins. And he's like, this, this just will not do. So he put a plan together, asked for permission to go and try and rebuild these walls of Jerusalem. He put a plan together, uh, but he understood the situation. He understood the times. And the way he navigated uh, this situation, I think, is very, very impressive. Because one of the first things he did was he assessed the situation. He tried to understand. You know, I do a lot of coaching. Uh, I, I don't think I even said so much. When I, I might, sometimes I'm very bad at introducing myself. I, I'll just take a small side uh, see again danish gets in my head silspo how do you say it a side road i don't know uh, and just present myself very quickly uh, i'm a psychologist uh, a business organizational psychologist so uh, and i've been doing that for the last three years i'm op originally from sierra leone married a dane in when i who i made in ywam like Clement uh, reveal yesterday, <laughs> and uh, but I've been in Denmark now since 2009, and I've been working as a psychologist since 2013. And as part of my job, sometimes I coach leaders and I help with organizational development. And one of the key principles that I work with sometimes is to say that you have to take a realistic view of where we are here and now, in order to have a clear vision and a proper vision for where you need to be. Yeah? I, I say that the most simple way to understand good strategy and, and, and goal setting and, and, and planning is to say, where are we now? And take an honest look at it, a realistic view of where we are here right now. Where do we want to be over there? And then start asking yourself the tough questions, how do we get there? In a room full of church leaders like yourselves, I know that you have a vision, you have a passion, you have a good sense of where you need to go or where you want to be or what God is calling you to. But an important part of the process, like Nehemiah, is to say, but where am I now? And have that understanding. What is the context that I'm in? This context we live in. 
And like I said, it doesn't matter whether it's about the technology in the world or the financial situation in the world or the political situation in the world. We have to have a really good understanding of where we are so that we know what to do and we can work towards the long-term vision. So Nehemiah, of course, the first thing he did, he went and took an assessment of where are these walls? What is the situation? Who is available? What resources do we have? And then he started this project. And of course, all of you know this. If God gives you a vision, you're going to get some resistance. It's never going to be easy. Isn't it true? Another honesty test. Who thinks it's difficult to implement what God has shown you? It's difficult. So there was resistance. There was, of course, spiritual resistance, but there was human resistance. There, 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 there were people fighting against him. Sanballat and his people, they're trying to mess up the whole thing. They, they were physically in danger. I love this verse where it says that in one hand they had their building tools, but in the other hand they had their swords ready to defend themselves if the enemy should show up. That's wisdom. That's not being naive and say, and please forgive me, don't misunderstand me. It's very easy sometimes to say, oh, God will protect me. You know, They, they said, well... God will protect us, but we'll have our swords at the ready because maybe God wants to use uh, our swords to protect us. It reminds me of a, a funny little story I heard once. Um, it said there was this guy, uh, and he was in this town, and there was, I sometimes mess up the story, but I'll do my best, yeah? But he was in this town, and there was a flood, and the water levels were rising. I can see some of you know this story, you're already smiling. Water levels are rising, and his neighbor comes and says, we're driving out of town. You know, come with us. Let's get out of here before, before the, the flood comes. And he goes, oh, no, don't worry. I've prayed. God will rescue me. Then another friend comes by with a boat later because water levels are rising. He's up on the top floor of the house, comes by with a boat, says, come, hop in with us. Let's get out of this place. He goes, nope, no, 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 no. I have prayed God will save me. Then actually the authorities are now, look, this guy's house is flooded now. He's hanging on to at the top of a high tree and a helicopter saying, hey, we're from the authorities. We're getting everyone out of here. You're one of the few left. He goes, oh, don't worry about me. God will save me. And as some of us know, this guy drowned because the water levels rose. He drowned. And he comes up to God and he's very upset with God. Lord, in your word, you promise how you'll save me and no harm will befall me. We'll drink poison, snakes will bite us. I thought you would rescue me from the flood. And God looks at me and says, he says, you're not easy to work with. I sent your neighbor with a car, you said no. I sent your neighbor with a boat, you said no. I said, I even sent an arranged for a helicopter to pick you up. You said no. He said, what else could I do? <laughs> Just a little humoristic way of saying, you know, that balance between reality and us doing things versus God playing his role. We need wisdom. We need to know. We can't just say, oh, God will provide or God will show or God will this. So he went in there and he had difficult situations to tackle Nehemiah. He had people on the outside tackling. And of course, again, and, I, and this is why I say to you, I got so much inspiration from Nehemiah when I was very much involved in church planting is that some of the difficulties was internal. There were internal conflicts. Again, anyone know about internal conflicts in church congregations? Yeah, honesty test again. Okay, only half of us are honest. <laughs> you know? I, 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 may, I normally make this really bad joke. You know, I am a trained in conflict mediation. And so I, 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 do, I do it a few times a year in different contexts, you know. But there's this bad joke I always make. I say, you know what? As long as you have human beings, you'll always have conflict. In fact, the only place where there are human beings and there are no conflict is in a graveyard because they're all dead. But as long as you have living, active human beings with opinions and ideas... You will always have conflicts, and that's realistic. But what's important is that these conflicts get resolved in a good way. 
get in a resolved in a way that is honoring to God and to each other. So Nehemiah, he, he had this on us. He did his assessment. He understood the situation. He made a plan. He went, uh, he, he, he went into the situation. He recruited people. They started doing the building. They got some opposition from outside. They had internal conflicts. There's a lot of stuff, but he kept going because he had a plan. He understood the people he was working with. He understood the context, and he had a plan, and he kept going, and he succeeded in his plan. Apparently, it took only 53 days to do this rebuilding work. Now, again, I don't know enough about, the, the, about building or about Jerusalem, what it was, but for me, it sounds pretty impressive that someone could do a major rebuilding of a wall in 53 days despite opposition from outside, difficulties internally. But I think it's because he had that wisdom. He had that understanding of the people he was working with, the context he is, he was in. So we, we are also like David, like Joseph, like Nehemiah. We are also many times in situations that are transition, like for David from one king to another, or difficulties like for, uh, for Joseph, where th there is crisis on the way, there is problems on the way. Or maybe it could be something like um, Nehemiah where we can see that things are not as they are and we, will get, we want to rebuild or we want to build. We want to establish the kingdom of God. We want to establish a church. We want to establish a ministry. We need to understand the climate. We need to understand the times. And I have a few examples. I have two examples I want to give you uh, of, of people have been impressed and how, how they read the times. Actually, before I do that, I want to give a couple of personal examples. Sometimes I have, avoid trying to talk too much about myself because it shouldn't be about me. But I have a couple of personal examples I want to share with you where I think God, in his mercy and his grace, helped me dodge a bullet or two. The first is, um, is just before the financial crisis in 2008. My wife and I were poised. We were in Scotland at the time as missionaries, and God in his goodness had blessed us uh, with a large gift from someone I knew that had gone to university. Uh, actually, you know, someone from the family. Uh, and so we were right on the edge of buying a house, and we were talked to a different uh, people, we talked to a bank that should lend money. But I remember my brother, my brother, he, uh, he's trained, in, he's an economist and he's a consultant in the energy sector in Sierra Leone. But I remember a few times he's spoken to me saying, the economic climate is very weird. I think a lot of stuff that's going on, both with the dot-com bubble back then and also with the, uh, that time with the subprime. He says, I think the economic market is unstable. And I remember even though we had this amazing offer of buying this house and we had this opportunity to borrow money, even though we were very broke missionaries at the time. Now I look back and think, why are they even willing to, to, to lend us money? But we know now <laughs> with, the, with, with the crisis that things were wrong, uh, that people were lending money to people they shouldn't have been lending money to. But what I remember is after my wife and I prayed, we, we tried our best to understand the situation. We prayed and... I had, we just had this sense of, no, let's not do this. Let's not do this. And interesting enough, and I'm not exaggerating, only a few months later, after we decided we're not going to do this, everything started to go wrong with the financial crisis there. And uh, house prices just plummeted in Scotland where we lived. And lots of people ended up in a lot of debts with paying for a debt for a house that was worth a lot less than the debt they actually owed on it. Now, I don't think I'm special and God loves me more than anybody else, but I just think that in that context, fortunately for me, I, was, I had a good advisor, my brother. So like David had the, the sons of Issachar to advise him to know what to do. My brother never directly said to me, don't, don't, uh, don't buy a house or anything. But I had, I had human advisors, but I had the Lord as an advisor and Fortunately for me, doesn't always happen. I actually listen to God and do what he says. 
Other times I completely screw up. That's the honest truth, you know. Uh, and it really helped me dodge a bullet. And I, and I know it's a bit of a far comparison, but I, in the same way, Joseph could have heard from God that famine is coming and, and ignored it and said, oh, no, you know, we'll, it will make it work. It's so important that we, we need to get these insights. We need to get these wisdom, both from human advisors that God has provided for us, but also how God sometimes speaks to us directly through his word or other ways and act upon it. And the second example, just very quickly, I want, I want to use, again, I felt God helped me dodge a bullet. Like, I've had a desire to be self-employed for many years. When I even started my, my, my master's, my candidates at Oxford University, I remember my long-term goal I remember I was part of this organization when I was getting sponsorship as a missionary uh, from people and, and they were getting tax reductions. I remember when I said to them, that's it, I'm done. Uh, I, don't, I don't need your services anymore. And they're like, oh, no, no, you can start up again. And I was like, nope, this is it, I'm done. Because I knew in my mind I was going to work for a while, then I was going to become self-employed. Because I've been very much inspired. That's another long story. But I was very much inspired by some people I met uh, in 2009, who found this wonderful balance that worked for them between do, being, being self-employed uh, but also doing ministry when the opportunity arrived. And I thought, I believe this is what I want for myself. I've, I've been a full-time missionary, but now actually I want to see if I can find another balance. So that was always my goal. And, I, and there was a transition. There was, in my job, there was chaos. This is what I'm saying. It's in these periods of transition and chaos. That's when we really need our minds to be sharpened, our spirits to be open to hear from God. And I remember a bigger company was going to take over the company I worked for. And it was chaos. This transitions process of buying this new company. It was very, very difficult. I find it very hard to be in. And I just wanted out. And I... I I literally got there where I was ready to just stop and just, I thought, now I'm going to go and be self-employed. But they talked to me and I talked to people who got some advice and in my heart I felt maybe now is not the time. So I made the decision to stay longer at this company. And again, only a few months went by and then suddenly we were in this corona crisis Everybody sent home, you know, no work to do. And again, I don't think I'm special and God loves me more than everybody else, but I'm grateful that somehow in that situation, I got some wisdom from God and some guidance from other people that made me avoid a situation where I would have given up my job that was providing, and it was a good job, providing for my family, and I suddenly would have been in this situation with corona, everybody sent home, no work, no customers, nothing. I really would have been in some trouble. But thankfully, I avoided that. And then after the corona situation, I felt at one point, now is the time. And I stepped out. And at the, uh, in the start of September, it will be three years since I started as self-employed. And the climate was just right then because it's gone so well. Beyond my wildest dreams, it's gone well. And I'm just so grateful to God and grateful for good people around me who've helped me. But again, it's that whole question of timing, of God's wisdom, of understanding the situation, you know. And we need to, we need to when these opportunities come, we need to take them. I want to finish uh, by giving you two in, uh, ex examples from other people that have inspired me. And where they try to understand the times and use this as an opportunity to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, there's this church called Life Church uh, in the U.S. It's led by a pastor called Craig Rochelle. I heard him tell the story. How many of you people use that, uh, the U version Bible? Yeah, there's a few of us. I use it too, you know. It's what I'm reading, reading for up here from my iPad. But basically, when he tells the story, the short version of the story he tells, basically, that Apple had this new thing called the App Store. See, we all know what an App Store is now, or Play Boutique in Android. But back then, it was completely new. They, everyone was developing, developing apps for the mobile phone. And they decided, you know what? What if we could create a Bible app? 
what if we could do something exciting with, with this? And they started a project. They barely had any money for it, etc. But they started this project to say, hey, we, can, we understand the times and the development of technology and mobile technology, etc. What if we could hop on this wave? I often say we need to be like surfers who are good at looking at the waves and timing to ride the waves. You see, what if we can hop on this wave that is all focused on technology and apps for mobile phones? And they ended up developing this app, which was one of the first Bible apps there was. Uh, and it's just grown and it's literally reaching millions of people now through this app. Millions of people, and they have so many languages, it's crazy. You know, you can go in and find pretty much, it would surprise me if you can go in there and, it, and not find the Bible in your language. And it's got all sorts of tools. And again, I feel they are so good at using what's going on. So that, for example, they have these daily devotionals. And for the last two weeks, what they've been doing is they've been having people related to the athletics and the Olympics to do these short devotions. Because again, they're reading the times. Everybody now, Olympics, Olympics, that's what's on people's minds. So they're like, yes, let's use the Olympics as a means of reaching out to people's hearts and doing devotionals by people who are former Olympians or present Olympians. And they just know how to read the times and know what to do. And they've ended up using this, developing this app that has reached so many people and brought the Bible to so many people in their language. Just think how, you know, when Jesus said, you know, go and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Who would have dreamt that the internet and mobile phones would be a part of that? Who would have dreamt of that, that 10 or 20 years ago? That the gospel would be able to go so far? Because honestly, even like in my home country of Sierra Leone, sometimes you see this scruffy looking person, not a lot of money, but he would just whip out a mobile phone. Everybody has mobile phone these days, isn't it true? Wherever you are, so many people and bringing the Bible to people that way. Another interesting uh, group I, I, I've met a few times and participated in one or two of their meetings and, and read their book is uh, this Areopagus. I think it's always a mess. And I can't remember his exact name. But basically, again, there's been a season. Again, it's nothing new. But there's been seasons when there's been a spiritual hunger amongst people. And for example, something like mindfulness meditation has really grown in terms of mental health. Sadly, as, especially since I'm a psychologist, I know quite a bit about this. Sadly, we're in a mental health crisis in the world. The World Health Organization is very aware of the fact that mental health is a growing problem. Stress, is depression, anxiety, it's a growing problem. And one of the ways people have worked with, uh, with, with, with dealing with these mental health problems has been of different forms of meditation, including mindfulness, etc. So there was this major wave of mindfulness sorry, that was growing. And they took this opportunity to say, okay, while there is this spiritual hunger, but there's also this mental health crisis that is drawing people towards meditation and mindfulness, what if we did something? And so they develop something they call Christfulness. And they have their book there that guides you through it. But basically, they, they've used this, what was going on in the world, their understanding of the times. They've used it as an opportunity, again, to advance the gospel of God. So we need to have our eyes open and our spiritual ears open to hear from God. What are the things that he's showing us? What are the opportunities that are out there? What are the waves that we can ride to further build the kingdom of God? To further advance the personal vision that God has given us. See, many of us like Nehemiah, God has given us a specific vision of a certain task that he would like us to, 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 to perform and to do for him. But we need to read the times to see how best can we do this. How best can we achieve God's purposes in this situation? So that's the heart of my message, is that we... Now, I'm, I don't mean to be rude. 
So forgive me if I sound rude. I feel like sometimes Christians, we become too naive. We become too much like the guy who keeps waiting for God to rescue him, you know. Uh, I often say that we should not be, it should not be like this that whenever we work, walk into a Christian community or walk into a church building or to a company like this, that we leave our brains behind at the door. Because that's how we feel sometimes. It feels like you have someone who's perfectly rational and wise when they're at work or when they're in all context, but put them in a Christian context, then it's as if their brain just dissolves. So we need to be sharp. We need to be sharp in our mind. We need to, to have wisdom. We need to understand what's going on. We, we, we can't be blind to or naive or, or ignorant, you know. The Bible says, let's not be ignorant of, of, of the devil's devices. So we need to not be ignorant of what's going on in the world. We need to not be ignorant of the trends in our society. Like I said, whether it's about the economy, about politics, about science, uh, spirituality, health, all these things. We need to stay sharp. We need wisdom and discernment to help us to navigate this. And this is why I like to use chess as a metaphor sometimes. To say that we need to be thinking three, four moves ahead. The best chess players, the most successful chess players, they're ones who can read so many moves ahead and can predict what's coming. And both with the wisdom God has given us, but also with the supernatural wisdom that God gives us, we need to be able to be discerning and think several moves ahead so we can navigate this secular world, so we can be effective followers of Christ in this world. So like yesterday, I want to just give you five minutes at the end. I think I, I've done it a, bit, a little bit better today than yesterday. We ran out of time yesterday. But there is five minutes at the end here where I want you to reflect and maybe share a little bit with your neighbor. Say, hey, how can, how can you adapt your strategies for your community? How can you read how can you understand the times? Are there some things, you know? And this is why sometimes it's dangerous to use the big examples like you version and stuff. I'm not expecting you to find the next breakthrough app. But I'm saying in the context where you are, are there some trends, some patterns, some opportunities? This is one of the reasons I started volunteering at, at this local Trilsus Huset that we have. Because they've done a wonderful job of developing this area that, that, that's, been, uh, that's been struggling for a while. And I've just gotten involved because I can see there's something happened there that's good. And I want to have the opportunity to bring some of the light of Christ in there. I have a couple of friends who too were in there. We, we're just getting involved. I, don't, I, don't, I, I genuinely don't know if I'm making a difference or not, but at least I'm there. I'm riding the wave with them. And as the opportunities arise, let's see what God will, let's see what God will do. Because I can see something bubbling there in our context. So it's an invitation. Now I shouldn't talk too much so that we run out of time. But it's an invitation to say, can you think of something now in your context that you are that you can be flexible and adapt and use wisdom to know what to do?